Thanks for joining us, everyone. The Society 2045 Friday Talks are interviews with people worldwide seeking to create a better future through social movements and thought leadership. We aim to bring together social movements from across various disciplines to help co-create a broader and more cohesive vision for the year 2045. We have a collective vision of what it could be like, but we want to add yours. We can create a more robust voice for change by bringing together adjacent movements and thought leaders. I'm Tulio Siragusa, one of the co-founders of Society 2045, and I'm joined today by Dave Landa, who is our guest. Hi, Dave, good to have you with us. Hey, Tulio, great to be here today. Looking forward to it. So before we get started and dive in a little bit, if you could just kindly introduce yourself, give us a little bit about who you are and what you do, we would really appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Dave Landa is my name, and I'm uh, currently the CEO of Kintone Corporation. Kintone Corporation is a U.S. subsidiary of a Japanese uh, public company, been public for about uh, 20 years now. I'm also sitting on uh, the board of directors of the Japanese parent company. It's on the Tokyo First Stock Exchange over there. And I also uh, help lead our U.S. Um, group called the Organizational Strategy Office uh, for the team as well. And um, yeah, Cybose is a pretty progressive company with a lot of interesting methods uh, and uh, tools around developing kind of a more modern work culture and even a more modern uh, teamwork-based society. Uh, that I've been pretty engaged with. Originally, I started as you know a software startup idea seven years ago with the company, and we've grown. But over the last five years, we ended up spending a lot of time and thought uh, around how the product um, aligns with culture and how we want to have an impact on society more broadly as an organization. Um, so that's kind of the business side. You know, as for me, I, you know, I live in Northern California. Have have a couple of boys, uh, teenagers in high school right now that keep me pretty active and busy, and enjoy all sorts of adventures. Uh, so, thank you, Dave. So, tell us a little bit about the culture that you work with. Why is it so interesting and progressive, uh, especially for a Japanese company? And uh, what impact is that having on the people that are part of that culture? Yeah, so uh, the give you a little bit of history. About 15 years ago, there was a bit of a existential crisis that this organization had. They uh, were a, a software startup in the traditional vein, very hard charging. Um, it was a Japanese company, so also had sort of a Japanese work around the clock mentality. Uh, went public in three years, fastest company in Japanese history to go from inception to IPO, and then spent the next few years uh, kind of with the proceeds of going public um, and some of the afterglow of that, acquiring companies and trying to grow really rapidly. Um, about five years into that, they started recognizing some serious problems, uh, really high turnover. The, the, the vision and the mission from the beginning was to make teamwork better. Um, but I literally got close to 30% turnover for the organization by, I think it was 2005. And, you know, huge kudos to the leadership at that time. Uh, they took a big step back and really thought about like, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of our business? What is the purpose of our lives even um, when we're doing business here? And, and what's the purpose of this organization? What can we do with it? And they really made a, a, a pretty significant shift toward people and, and having more of a human centric approach. And, the, and kind of the biggest sort of concept that came out of that, it's kind of a simple term, but it's had a, a broad and persistent uh, impact is just a hundred different people have a hundred different work styles. And that was the concept. That was the simple phrase uh, that they sort of came up with to transform the organization. 
And what that led to was a number of different policies um, around one was kind of a, a mama internship. So, you know, hundred different people means, you know, women uh, who raise kids, you know, have pregnancies, uh, they aren't uh, in the same situation as men who can potentially be, you know, fully engaged 100% of the time nonstop throughout their career. So creating opportunities and understanding these differences was, you know, one key piece. Our, our founder ended up, uh, you know, after that time, he was a young guy when he started, you know, he's still relatively young, you know, now that we're 20 plus years in, but uh, he also has, you know, he's taken paternity leave uh, in Japan. Uh, he's the only CEO in the Japanese first stock exchange to have ever done that. And now he's done it three times. Um, so, you know, I think there were, you know, sort of very gender equity focused things that this organization jumped into initially from that from that concept of a hundred different people, hundred different work styles, but also, you know, it, it enabled and supported the development of remote work, uh, of part-time work, um, of a whole variety of different work styles that the organization grew to support uh, and, and encourage. Um, and, yeah, as we've continued to sort of evolve on that core concept uh, and and think more deeply on it, you know, our our mission evolved a little bit from just make teamwork better to building a society brimming with teamwork, and that's been our mission now for the past five years or so, and so we've really started to look beyond our own walls, uh, our own offices, and start thinking about how not only how our software can actually support that type of um, initiative, but how some of the methods that we deployed internally could be shared externally to try to start having an impact on other organizations, on other, on other teams. Um, so that was a lot there, maybe I'll- <laughs> No, that's, that I'll sounds that. amazing. Uh, what's amazing, I think to all of us is there's this, uh, misunderstanding or disinformation out there or assumption that big public companies or uh, companies that are in more hierarchical type of societies can't thrive without structured and conformity and standardized everything, right? And even companies preparing for an IPO, they're pushing constantly towards standardizing everything, structuring everything. The idea of a hundred people with a hundred different way of doing things is considered a risk and an anomaly. And that's sounds as if that's basically people that are misinformed. What do you say about that when organizations are surprised about you guys doing this and making it work and then extending it to the point where not only is it working for us, we want other people to do the same thing. What's that been like in terms of dealing with the naysayers? What do you say about that? Yeah, I, you know, I think looking back, you know, there's definitely challenges in supporting those types of different work styles, right? Getting the getting the systems right, uh, getting the communication between different team members right. If one person wants to have a different work style than another in a team, you know, ensuring that it still works. There's a lot of communication and, and really it comes down, it's, it's a high level concept, but it comes down to every individual. That's the whole point. Like everyone might have a slightly different way they want to do things or, or their availability and what have you. And each team has to kind of work through that. And you have to have a respect for the individual uh, to be able to do that. So it's not easy. Like you just don't, you know, mandate something and, and it happens. You do have to have uh, an indiv a respect of the individual and uh, a respect of communication to make those sort of things work. So that's, you know, one thing is kind of like it, it is a challenge, you know, no, there's no doubt about it. But in the end, it creates uh, a much more engaged and, and happy team. Like we went from that 30% turnover rate, 
now for the last decade plus, we've been well under 5%. And I think a lot of it has to do with that transition and that focus. Um, but th there's another thing which I think is, is really fascinating and interesting uh, that, I, that I share with folks is like, it's coming. You know, it, this is, this is the, the way the world is moving, the way organizations are moving because of this information transformation. Like we have, and we're part of it, and other organizations are part of creating a world, I should say, that is open and transparent. And, you know, if you want to be effective as an organization, you have to share information, you have to empower people to see information and empower them to be part of the solutions. And a part of that is you know, allowing yeah. people to be who they are and, and work in a style in which uh, they're feeling most happy and, and most authentic. And, and that's going to be the most productive and effective way in the long run uh, to, to run an organization, I think. And, you know, the internet's here, these, these open platforms are here, the information is here. And so I think you need to start thinking about how that's going to shift the way organizations work. Um, and if you, and if you're not thinking about it, then honestly, you're, you're, you're falling behind, I think. So Dave, this is great. You've touched on this a little bit just recently, just now. But I'm curious, what do you think needs to happen to go from where we are right now as a society to where we could be, let's say, in 2045, adopting some of these principles, if not all of these principles? How do we get there, in your opinion? I think it's a process of providing methods and tools for organizations to lead in this sort of way, um, empowering individuals who want to build organizations based on these principles of openness and flexibility, um, creating examples of organizations that are doing it and that are empowering different folks within society to be a part of it. Um, through that sort of flexible work style, through that, that uh, open access. Um, so, it, you know, to me, it's, it's step by step. My, my experience, at least within our organization, is that, you know, we're, we're a software company first. We sell our, our software. It's a digital workplace platform. We have utilized it internally to create a very open organization uh, a very transparent organization when it comes to decision making, problem solving, problem sharing, even governance. And I think showing examples of how that can be done. And then, you know, ideally uh, encouraging and supporting from a resource standpoint, uh, other organizations who want to move down that road um, and uh, maybe individuals who want to start something new uh, with those principles in mind. Um, that's the way I'm thinking about it. Take time, but I think through education and tools and methods and, and hopefully galvanizing more groups and individuals around that idea, uh, we can move it forward. Dave, what do you think uh, will get adopted faster and what do you think will require more work and what, what are the obstacles in your opinion of all the things in movement where do you think uh, companies can adapt things the easiest and fastest way, especially traditional hierarchical type of fiat organizations where it's very hard for them to make this shift. It's difficult, right? Yeah. Where do you think they can succeed at going in the right direction and what obstacles do they need to overcome to get there? I think, you know, just thinking on, on our example, just to give a, a quick example and maybe extrapolate from there. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, we've been developing these sort of open team-based problem sharing and problem solving methods and creating sort of a structured tool around that and extended that to sort of a 
a pretty radical collaborative decision-making process that we rolled out uh, internally as well in our organization. And it got to the, to the point where we started thinking about uh, our board of directors, um, that it had been basically our three founders who had been the board of directors for a decade plus. And, you know, said, hey, we're an open organization. We share all of our decision-making, our executive meetings are all open to the team. Um, people can comment, respond. You know, why is it that our board of directors are still, you know, just the three founders? If we talk about the fact that anyone can be a part of a decision-making process, anyone can can be a member of the board. If if what it requires is being able to, you know, have the responsibility of reviewing decisions, auditing those decisions, and having sort of input on them. So. What we actually did was we transitioned our board of directors from those three founders to 17 people in our organization who essentially raised their hand and said, I'm willing to take the responsibility to be a member of the board and sort of fulfill those duties. And the only sort of requirement or the only um, background I have in this is the fact that I have access to all the information that anyone else does to make these decisions. Maybe, you know, not uh, any special expertise, but uh, have that willingness and that desire to see that the you know, company does the best it can and, and follows the, the rules. And so we ended up changing our board of directors to 17 members of the team who ranged in age from 23 to 52. Uh, and added five women to the board and overnight became an organization uh, that had the most women representation uh, on the Tokyo First Stock Exchange. Um, and, and, and so I think, you know, that, that was our example of how you can do it. You know, we continue to move forward with this and uh, there's internal debate about, you know, what the next board should look like. Uh, and and how we go through that process of determining who's on the board. But, but the idea is, if you have an open organization, one that uh, enables folks to see the information they need to make informed decisions, or even more importantly, ask informed questions and have a, an environment that encourages those types of questions, encourages uh, raising problems, then, then you're going to move forward. And so thinking back, <laughs> extrapolating now, okay, what's the first step? To me, for us, it was enabling an open problem sharing and solving method internally and creating safe space for team members to raise problems uh, and then having a mechanism to bring team members together to respectfully resolve those problems, work through those problems in a very structured way that developed a very common nomenclature amongst the team members. So everyone was speaking in the same language about these issues, about these problems, and working together in a structured way to then resolve them. And I think what that does is builds a tremendous amount of trust to then move the company in, in further directions um, where you can have more flexibility among team members. People tend to trust one another. They're open with one another. They raise issues. If there's an issue, uh, they resolve them respectfully in a structured way. A and you can start having that more open and flexible type organization as a result. So again, there was a lot there, but I think, uh, you know, if you can initiate that sort of problem sharing and problem solving mechanism into an organization that starts opening the doors to a lot of other things. I don't know of any other company that has that open door access to becoming a board member. I mean, that's uh, incredibly talk about uh, uh, authority share shared authority environment. Um, Want to just talk about the impact this is having on people themselves, mm. right? Uh, suddenly uh, you find yourself in an organization where there's a, a higher level of women representation on the board in any other company in the Tokyo Stock Exchange. What is that doing 
for women in business. Nice. Suddenly you have the ability to step up and participate as a board member just because you have the knowledge information of your company, not any specific skills, but you're learning as you participate in this. What is that doing to the people that perhaps didn't think they would ever even have a shot in their career to participate in this? And the ripple effect that's happening in their families and the people that's surrounding them. Can you share a little bit about the people aspect of this? What is the impact this is having on the people? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's uh, it's a great question. I, I think it encourages folks to you know have more confidence in their opinions, in their inputs. Um, it, you know, an interesting sidebar here uh, is is uh, just recently um, our our founder had suggested that you know as we look to our board of directors in the future should we intentionally try to create a majority female board and he was kind of proposing that because he felt like you know it's 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 a statement it's something that um could just by the very fact of it happening could potentially have that sort of ripple effect, that sort of impact. People recognize this is possible. This is a Tokyo first stock exchange company. You know, it, it's something that, um, that just creates a new realm of what is possible, a new idea of what is possible in an organ, in, in a society that has been, you know, pretty male dominated for sure. Um, but it was what was really interesting about this is that he raised that up to the organization across the board. He said, this is what I'm thinking. This is why I'm thinking it. And he put it into our decision. We have this decision making process and he raised it up and uh, anyone in the organization could then provide their inputs and opinions on it. And he received literally hundreds of inputs and feedback and interestingly enough, a lot of them from women saying, I don't think this is a good idea because you're, you, you're just sort of forcing it and it's you know affirmative action without some other additional justification. And it was a really interesting conversation that opened up um, around that. And ultimately he's kind of Pull, we don't know where we're going exactly yet, but ultimately he kind of pulled back from that, uh, that idea and that decision because so many people felt like, you know, uh, what we're trying to promote is an open society, a one that empowers people to participate um, and just open, you know, open information we're not necessarily just trying to create gender equity. We certainly believe that that'll come from that uh, over time, but it's, it's our role to talk about how information is open so anyone can be a board member. Um, and that includes everyone in society, right? Uh, it's not that we're, we're just a single sort of gender equity organization. And that came from a lot of women in our organization, right? So, so to answer your question, I think by doing this and creating this type of sort of philosophy around what a, a board member should be and what a member of an organization should be and what they should have access to and what they should be empowered to do and to say, it gave them the, you know, it gave everyone the confidence and the power to say, hey, CEO, hey, founder, this is a great idea, but I don't think it's the right idea. And this is why. And it's just empowered people to speak up more. Um, and to share their opinions and their inputs. And ultimately, we think, has given our leadership and the folks who are ultimately making that decision better information to make that decision. And so we're hoping that can, you know, disperse beyond and to other organizations as well. But we feel like we're starting to make a lot better decisions based on much more broad input from folks who feel comfortable and safe to, to, to provide their input and respected enough to provide that input. Amazing. What do you think are good adjacent movement that align with this philosophy? And what are your thoughts in terms of bringing this to society? Are you, how are you guys going about packaging it so that it can be something that can be adopted by other 
organizations? What's the thought process there? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I think in many ways, although there's definitely some, some caveats here, but I think in many ways, the gig economy trend and the gig economy movement supports some of the, the flexible work style ideas we have. I think there's, there's problems with many aspects of the gig economy when, it, when you have the innovators and the visionaries creating a traditional company that is supporting folks who want to have a more flexible lifestyle, but essentially, you know, creating a workforce of service workers without providing benefits, right? Um, so, so I think there's some challenges with the gig economy, but I think the, the underlying value proposition of trying to empower people to have a more flexible work style and, and do the things they want to do um, and, uh, and, and have that freedom I think aligns with some of the things that you know we're trying to promote and we're trying to do. Um, I think uh, from from my perspective, what we're trying to do on that front is you know we we're actually just starting to develop uh, a foundation we want to get started uh, that we're calling sort of the Game Changer Foundation. It's just a working working name for now. Um, but we talk about it as a KT game changer and KT stands for K is Kome Sedai. And that's a Japanese concept, um, four characters that mean open, clear, honest, and loud. And the concept is really about trans, you know, simple, simplified is it's about transparency, but it's about transparency in a way that you're being honest and comfortable. Like if you're saying it out loud, you would be very comfortable. You know, if, if you're saying it just amongst, you know, a couple of people, uh, the same thing you would be comfortable saying out loud to everybody, right? So that's kind of the honesty side of things. Um, and, and then clear is just, you know, make sure there's no mistakes in understanding. Um, and so this Kome Sedai concept is about having, uh, open and honest intentions and speaking open and loudly. Um, and then T is for teamwork. Um, and then game changer is trying to get, you know, kind of change the nature of organizations to provide more flexib flexibility, provide more openness. And ultimately we think those types of organizations are gonna be able to support those, you know, maybe less supported groups in the past. I think, you know, from a gender equity, racial equity um, standpoint, we think the more flexible and open organizations are, uh, the more inclusive those organizations become and more inclusive uh, society and, and the economy becomes. So, so from, from what we're trying to do is, is maybe support the so, so be a part of kind of the gig economy from a different perspective, one of social impact and one of um, supporting entrepreneurial vision, um, uh, as opposed to just supporting, you know, a, a, a solution for service workers necessarily. It's more, we want to create a, a gig economy uh, ecosystem that can support new ideas, uh, new organizations that are supporting more uh, social impact initiatives. So that's kind of where we're going with those sort of few things in mind. Love it. We're coming up on time. I want to open it up to uh, other folks to ask questions, but wanted to, as a final question, ask you, what's at stake if this doesn't happen? What happens if 2045 comes around and we're still operating the way we are today? What's, well, I, what's the risk of not getting there? To me, it's, it's sort of continued division and polarization uh, in society. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's lots of different 
issues, lots of different things out there uh, that that are causing divisions and polarization. But I think uh, opportunity, um, uh, economics, um, and structures, organizational structures are things that continue to um, support that division and polarization. And so if we don't start moving toward different types of organizations and different types of ways of including people uh, into society in, in, in meaningful ways, then I think the concern is that, you know, we, we continue going down a further polarized and, and divided society and, and world. I think, you know, it's that big and from my perspective. Hey, thank you. Uh, fellow Society 25ers, you got some questions today? Matt. Yeah, I do. Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Just Tulio. jump right in. Thanks, thanks, Tulio. So thank you very much, Dave, for, um, for that sharing and, and kind of uh, kudos to you in the sense of having um, experienced firsthand the hierarchical nature of, you know, Japanese corporations. You know, my son-in-law's mentor is the CEO of a healthcare company that owns about eight hospitals in Fukuoka province. And, and I got to spend some time there in that context. And the, the CEO is kind of the, the lord of the manor in some sense. Uh, it, so, so kudos that to your CEO. Uh, the curiosity that I have is what's the turnover like? Because there's a lot, I think, I think, what the turnover is like says a lot about the impact and effect of the culture that you've built. Yeah, so I think I, I mentioned briefly there, but for the last decade, uh, over a decade now, we've been well under 5%. So, mm -hmm. you know, two to 3% uh, most years and under 5% for this entire, like last 11 years. Yeah. Uh, so after that, I think it was 2005, where we sort of started that transformation. Um, it took us about five years to get down from 30, uh, 30 almost 30% to, to under 5%, but we've been consistently below that now. Okay, and, and, and one follow-up question, it reminds me a little bit of, I mean, I can't remember the, the name of the guy, but there was a whole movement, mm, 1990s, I think, called Open Book Management, um, it came out of a company in Ohio that saved themselves by just opening their, their, their financial books up to everybody. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And the, the CEO wrote a book and it became a bit of a movement. Um, it, are all of the principles philosophy is, you know, is somebody working on a book? That's, I guess that's the, the bottom line. <laughs> well, truth be told, our, our, our CEO founder has written two books already published okay. two books, bestsellers on Amazon Japanese business books. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one was all I ever thought about was team. Um, and then the other one, I forget the exact translation, but it has to do with uh, beware the monster. Uh, and the monster is, is the desire for, you know, keeping information secret and, and keeping hierarchy. Uh, so he's, He's written two books, Aono San's his name. And then our kind of our, our other founder who was, uh, drove our HR and kind of drove our uh, development of those policies I talked about. He's also written a book uh, and, and he, that was entitled uh, Ultra Light Management. It was also uh, another bestseller. And it really speaks to this idea of empowering team members uh, to be able to make decisions and, and really decentralizing the organization and decentralizing the decision-making processes within an organization. So yeah, we have at least three books. I think a fourth and fifth one are coming out between those two pretty soon too. That, that's great. Sorry. Okay. So the question is, what's the, what's the actual product? What's the software that you guys develop and, 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 and sell in, in the marketplace? Yeah. So um <laughs> It's kind of an older term now, but still used in Japan, but it's a groupware product. Okay. Um, but in particular, the, the unique thing about Kintone, with this, 
this is now the major product. We have four different software products uh, and they've been around business office productivity tools and, and team management. But in 2011, we launched Kintone, uh, which is now the, 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 the largest product by far. And what's unique about Kintone is that it's a, a no-code digital workplace platform, which means people, not, not only coders, but a uh, subject matter expert, um, can build a software solution to manage their own processes. Um, and then on top of that, there's, so, so you kind of create a database, uh, a workflow, and then the whole collaboration uh, piece on top of that. So, so, so the Kintone platform is, is what we, our own organization, use all day, every day to manage all of our business processes and to do all of our communication and collaboration. And so that's why when we have an executive meeting or a board meeting, it's shared on that platform for everyone to see and everyone to comment on and everyone to ask questions. In a, in a quick phrase, maybe a digital work, a customizable digital workplace. Yeah, but it sounds like it's very congruent with the whole philosophy of the company that they're hand in glove. Yeah. Very aligned. And, and that's really been, you know, it was a revelation for me when I, when I first joined, I started understanding that connection. Um, and it, and it is very much, uh, sort of, uh, self-reinforcing, if you will, the two. Beautiful, thank you. All right, so I have a question kind of following up on, the, on what Tuli asked. Um, of what, what will happen in the future if we continue where we're going and, and you give, give us a good answer? Um, the, the, kind of, the reverse of that is, is how can we take what you guys have done and spread it to other companies in Japan? Because you, you Obviously, this Japanese company they can speak the lingo and not mm. just the Japanese, but I mean the way that they talk and all that. Um, so, how can we what can we do to to kind of spread out? Yeah, we've been we've been trying. We've been doing a lot of effort on that front. So, uh, a couple things like our founder had joined uh, a president's commission uh, on transforming Japanese business culture that they ha actually had. So he's been providing some of his experience and insight that way. Um, but also about five years ago, I think about five or six years ago, uh, the company launched a Institute, the teamwork research Institute, they call it TRI in which, uh, they've been providing, uh, sort of thought leadership, uh, documents and resources and consulting with other organizations on how to transform their organization similarly. Uh, and we've had pretty significant um, engagements with some of the larger corporations in Japan, Panasonic uh, and others. Um, and then we also do regular sort of seminars that folks can join. Uh, so, so a combination of you sort of publishing resources, providing webinars and seminars on these concepts, and then actual in consulting engagements with other organizations. So that's become, that's become a side business of ours in Japan. And this organizational strategy office that is now a global office for the company, we're trying to bring that uh, outside of Japan as well into to the US. Great. So we, we'll, we're more than happy to help with that. That's yes. fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a wonderful interview. This is really exciting and, and, and um, cool to listen to. I have a question. Um, Japan, as far as I know, is the only, comp only uh, country in the world to have a word for death from overwork. Uh, Karoshi, right? So I'm really curious, was it simply that you had a 30% turnover rate that made them set up and say, we got to do something different? Or were there other things that contributed to that? And how did you overcome that resistance? And then related to what Matt just said, do you see things changing in Japan as well as in the U.S. around changing that culture from you have to work till you drop dead to you should work to contribute and make your own life enriched as well as those of others? Yeah, yeah, great question. That that is true. They do have that term, um, and you know the salary man, you know, the standard guy who works around the clock and is devoted to the office and um, and not so much the family. Um, so one of those, one of the answers in terms of how was it received uh, when we made that transition, um, 
there were definitely folks uh, in those first four or five years as we started really digging deeper into that transition that left. So, I mean, the turnover <laughs> continued for a few years before we got down to that point. So, you know, there was um, folks who like, you know, this is what I know and this is what I understand and this is the way I want you know, to work and this is the type of organization I want to be in. And so what you guys are talking about is, is not something, you know, I want to be a part of, I'm going to go and be in the more traditional organizations. And so that there was that sort of process back, you know, 2005 through 2010, you know, call it weeding out, uh, you know, call it what you will. Um, so that definitely did occur. Besides the turnover, was there were there other factors that allowed this to come forward, or was it just the turnover that, yeah. that triggered it? And then is do you see that actually changing in Japan? Turnover was definitely the catalyst. Um, I think the reality was that our you know there were three founders, but kind of our lead founder, I think you know his he had a personality or he had a a, a view of the world as well as our HR leader, who was the other one who wrote a book, they had a view of the world that was a little bit beyond Japanese society and a little bit beyond that tradition. And, and I think they had an inclination to, to be a little bit different, you know, based on uh, their experiences. Um, and so I think there might've been a little bit there as well, but there were, you know, obviously there were things going on in society around that time uh, as well with, you know, people, there was like news items about literally people dying in their office, right? Um, and so I think it, you know, there was something to that, but, but it was, you know, there, there, the, the driving factor was survival of the organization um, that really turned in that direction. But I think it just coalesced with these other ideas and these other thoughts that they have. Um, and then in terms of like the rest of society catching on, it, it seems to be more and more, but it's hard to say <laughs> yeah. for, for me. I, I, I do feel like younger generation is hearing this message are, are being you know more open to different aspects of, uh, of life and, and work styles, but I don't have like any good actual statistics on that <laughs> to share with you. I have a couple of questions. One is um, you talk about a board of 17 people. Um, it sounds like all of them are uh, company insiders. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So that first transition, uh, they were all insiders. Now that's that's going to be definitely changing this upcoming year to have some external folks. But yes, it was actually all insiders. And and so the question then is, um, decision making power within the board. Mm. How's that divided? Yeah. So it, the interesting the interesting thing here is that the, the, the underlying concept of this transition was that anyone can be a board member, partially because board members really didn't have any power, really didn't have any decision-making um, because the organization is already so open in the decision-making process and so open with all of the information that goes into major decisions and strategic decisions that that's all openly shared on our platform for folks, unless it's, you know, highly confidential, but that's all openly shared for folks to be able to have input. And ultimately the idea is that the general managers or the subject matter experts those experts who are entrusted to make decisions are already being very much overseen and audited every day in all their decisions. And so in a way, the board is really just figureheads who are, you know, giving one last stamp of approval, or if there's something that suddenly is egregious, um, you know, raising their hand and calling it out. But there, there was no real particular decision making, you know, going on there, were, there were formal proceedings that needed to be done because of the, you know, the securities laws. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, there was very little of that. It was more just inputs and, and questions, in addition to what have might already been asked uh, internally. 
Now, does that does that make sense? It's, yeah, it's a it does. A radical, a radical view. Yeah, uh, well. and a radical approach. But I can send you a couple articles if you're interested that Absolutely. covered this uh, when yeah. we when we announced it and when we did that. Yeah, the last question, at least for me, is um, around ownership. Mm. Did that change at all? Um, and what's what? Obviously, it's a public company. Um, what what's the situation as far as ownership within uh, the staff, and especially here with a remote office in the United States? You mean like actual ownership of the company, like stock Correct. ownership? Yes. Yeah. So um, there was a, you know, part of this this movement uh, a few years ago was to try to uh, encourage more small hold, you know, stock holdings uh, amongst the team and also beyond people who just sort of uh, had an affinity with our our concept of company culture. Uh, and so we have really started trying to promote uh, that sort of small ownership and transition from the big, uh, uh, the big investor houses holding that. And, and we have, we have just, just dispersed it more over the last few years. And there is a broader base of, of, ownership now uh, but it's still you know pretty um uh institutional investor heavy in terms of the ownership um in terms of uh providing team members the opportunity for ownership so yeah actually when we first started here in the u.s we we had sort of uh uh every team member was given uh sort of a, a, a phantom stock uh, sharing stock match program for team members to be invested in, in it. Um, we've transitioned over time as, you know, the organizations evolved, uh, but definitely um, the idea of team members having a share of the organization is definitely a key element. Although we've had some, some philosophical thoughts back and forth on that because our leadership has, has pushed the idea that, Hey, you know, it's not about profit. We, we kind of try to think of ourselves as our mission is, is primary and creating a society brimming with teamwork is what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to accomplish profits. Um, and so, you know, team members, you know, you know, looking at their stock and being concerned about our stock price going up and down is not actually what we wanted. We wanted team members who were really engaged with the vision and the culture. And so that was what was motivating and, you know, and really inspiring them more than the stock price. Uh, so we were always trying to balance that, <laughs> you know. Um, that's, that's a really cool example of, of ownership isn't always the answer when we're inside a system that that has distributed ownership in, in the way that it's so insist institutionalized. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dave. I, I just had another question. Sure. How, how, um, how have you seen the difference between how staff in Japan react to these policies, these changes and the, the staff here in San Francisco? Yeah. Good question. I, I think some of the concepts, tend to be more readily accepted uh, and quickly and more quickly accepted here. Um, but I've also seen, uh, you know, that one example, I just gave the example about the board members, but there's a number of other examples as well, where I think it's, it's had a really deeper impact and significance and, people have really latched onto some of these ideas and concepts in Japan. And it's, it's almost more passionate, um, uh -huh. maybe because it's more unique um, in, in some cases. Um, and, and so I think there's a really deep feeling um, that folks get when they start not only hearing the concepts, but experiencing them in action um, and having that empowerment to be able to be part of the, the conversation in that way. So I think, uh, you know, slightly different in that way. I think people accept them here and, and it's meaningful 
but maybe it's like a little bit more deep uh, in terms of the impact uh, in Japan, just because it's, it's a, maybe a little more unique. That's awesome. Thanks again for, for joining us. That was thank so you so much. much. You guys, thank, yeah, you so thank you guys. Really appreciate the conversation and, and really inspired by what you guys are trying to do with Society 2045. So, Well, Dave, it's been really great to have you with us today. It's clear that uh, we need to work on more use cases that are not about how do you, you know, uh, grow your business and get more profitable. There's tons of material on that, right? We need to have more use cases on how to make people's lives better. How can companies be a catalyst to improving society, which is the direction of where you guys are going. So congratulations for that. We hope uh, as you expand your board and bring in some outsiders, maybe some of those will bring back those principles into their own companies as well. So yeah. we wish you a lot of success uh, with that. And uh, let's definitely stay in touch. So much to be done. It's great to hear that there's companies uh, already underway to creating a better society, a society in 2045 that we can all be proud of. Thank you.